All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. J.D. Armstrong. I'm the Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist here at the University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy. And uh, uh, one of the things I do is I put together these talks, and we've got a really great presentation this week, or this month. Um, and I just wanted to welcome you all here. Uh, we appreciate you coming up here. And we wanted to, of course, also welcome our guests at our satellite station over at Coronado Shores in Oregon. Some of you probably remember Safan Kahali. Hi, Safan. She's, she's running the, uh, the show for us over there. Thank you, Safan. We appreciate that. Um, so tonight's speaker is Thomas Lowe. And Thomas is the newest addition to the uh, PanStars team. He's one of the observers there. And he uh, got his undergraduate degree at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and the, the he got his, uh, his graduate education from the University of Victoria um, univer and the University of British Columbia. So he has uh, a quite... Just in case <laughs> you want to know. Well, let me see. <laughs> That's my birthmark. All right. So it's not a tattoo. It's a birthmark. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'm just going to adjust some sound here so that we sure. don't get that reverb again. All right. So, um, and obviously comes from Canada. He also, uh, we stole him from the Lowell Observatory, I hear. Is that? Uh, well, I was at Lick a, a few oh, years Oh, at Lick back. Observatory, yeah. yes. Yeah. So we stole him from there. Um, we've been very fortunate to have him uh, working with PanStars. And I'll let him go ahead and talk about PanStars Observatory. Great. Thanks, J.D. All right. Hey, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, like J.D. said, uh, welcome, all of you, to the uh, IFA's Advanced Technology Research Center in beautiful Pukalani. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about the PanStars project, which is uh, an amazing observatory on Haleakala. And as you'll see, uh, they're not enormous telescopes, but they really have a lot of bang for the buck. And JD already gave the shout out to Coronado Shores. So once again, hi, Safan. And so uh, what is PanStars? Now, every project needs a catchy acronym, so PANSTARS is no exception. So what PANSTARS stands for is the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. And that really conveys what the whole idea behind the project is. So there's two components. It's a, it's a survey telescope, so it's designed to survey the entire sky that's visible from our location in Hawaii. And as well, there's another component that we're also taking advantage of, and that's this rapid response system. And this is where we follow up observations obtained from other observatories and in some instances even space telescopes and do follow up observations um, with our telescopes. It consists of two observatories and support facilities uh, associated with cyber infrastructure and it has a relatively small team. Uh, the PanStar Sky Surveys were supported by the PanStars One Science Consortium which ran from 2010 to 2014. The surveys uh, have been completed and a public data release was done in December 2016 that's being hosted by the Space Telescope Science Institute. And I have some handouts here that uh, you guys can help yourselves to later at the end of the talk. And they, uh, just a little blurb on the, on the data archive, and, and this is a public archive. You can visit the site at SDSCI and play around with images and, and get access to the data. The, there'll be another release later this year, which is the time domain results in the data release two, and then a following data release probably in 2018, which is gonna contain more data. Oh, okay. All right, sorry. Uh, astronomers usually like to be kind of kept in the dark, so. <laughs> I just naturally gravitate to the dark. So, uh, the dark side, exactly. So the, the data release three will have um, a lot more data on proper motions, parallax, and stellar classifications, and all kinds of other good things. Currently, since the survey was completed, most of our primary uh, research now is supported by the NASA Near Earth Object Office, and we are uh, undertaking uh, a search for near Earth objects. These are objects that 
potentially could potentially hit the Earth. Um, so they're, they, they say objects because not all of them are asteroids. There's also comets and that's also, also thrown in the mix. So right now that's where most of our funding's coming from, NASA. <coughs> so where is it located? Well, it's on the um, summit of Haleakala. Well, not the summit, but pretty close to the summit. And this is actually an old photo. So this is the, the Haleakala Observatory site. And all of this stuff here is belongs to the U.S. Air Force. And, and then here's the little Panstars, Panstars 1, Panstars 2. So like I said, they're, they're not big telescopes, but they produce an amazing amount of results. This is the footprint for the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, which has been renamed the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. And this photo doesn't show the Falks North Telescope, which is another amazing telescope used for public education. And I, there's a more updated photo showing the DKIS dome. So DKIS is still under construction. It's probably not going to see first light till about 2020. But you can see it, it, it dwarfs us by comparison. It's a four meter solar telescope and it sits pretty high up. So um, uh, one of the things that I find myself doing is I use de-kissed as a verb, as in careful you don't get de-kissed, or I think we just got de-kissed. Because you can see this enormous dome kind of blocks out part of our view of the sky. So oh, we just have to wait, if, you know, we just avoid pointing the telescope in that part of the sky. Well, that's just, you know, the hazards of, you know, having large neighbors. <laughs> So PS1 and PS2 are both, they're two meter class telescopes. They're actually 1.8 meters in diameter. That's the diameter of the primary mirror. They're, they're both the same optical design. They're relatively fast optics, f4.4 for those photography buffs in the crowd. They're a Richie Kretchan design with a three element corrector. So Richie Kretchan telescopes are really good optical design. Uh, especially for wide field telescopes because you need to correct the off-axis aberrations like coma and you want a nice aberration free field of view over the entire uh, 3.2 degree field of view. So that's an enormous field of view. Most telescopes at the uh, higher F numbers are, are just, you know, their field of view is tens of maybe arc minutes. So to have a three degree field of view or seven square degrees is, is enormous. But that's really what you need for a survey telescope. Uh, and, but the one thing about uh, the, both telescopes is they have the world's largest CCD cameras. PS1 has a 1.4 gigapixel CCD camera. And so although they're the same mechanical design or the same, pardon me, optical design, the PS2 has a completely different mechanical design and fabri fabrication and a, a totally different dome implementation. And as well, the, the fabrication of the PS2 optics were far superior. And the Gigapixel 2 camera has a much better performance. So here's some of the early photos. So they started construction of PS1 in 2005. And then by 2009, they saw first light, and then the survey proper started in 2010. So here's a schematic. You can see this little purple man here. That just gives you a sense of the scale. And there's three different levels to the telescope. So a lot, a lot of the auxiliary equipment, the computer room and that is at the lower level. And then there's different levels. I mean, two meters, you know, we consider that a small telescope in today's day and age of 10 meter telescopes and, and the 30 meter telescope. But you know, any amateur astronomer would kill to have a two meter telescope. That would be phenomenal. So here's PS2 and it's uh, in, the, in the construction area. And this is a magnificent photo of it in the, in the insulated dome. And so if PS1, if PS1, you got to remember, is the prototype. So PS2 is kind of the new and improved version. So if you want to think of PS1 as like a Chevrolet, 
PS2 would be like a Cadillac. So we're really eagerly anticipating the, the arrival of uh, the, the Gigapixel 2 camera. So as I mentioned, this Panzer has a very wide field of view. So this is a picture of the, does anyone know what these nebulae are? Anyone want to guess? Remember, there are prizes available. <laughs> so this is the, the Lagoon Nebula, and this is the Trifid Nebula. Very rarely would you ever get them in the same image, but because of our huge field of view. And does, does anyone know what the, how large the moon is on the sky? Half a degree. So the moon subtends half a degree on the sky. So three degrees across, you could fit six full moons across the image. So in, in total, you could fit over 30 full moons in this picture. So that, that's an amazing, amazingly wide field of view. But that's, that's really what you need to do a survey. Because, you, you know, if you only have a small field of view, it's going to take you forever to survey the entire sky. And here's some of the optical elements. There's the primary mirror and the secondary. And you can see that, you know, it really looks more like a donut, the primary, because it's a Cassegrain telescope. So the light comes in off the primary, then gets reflected off the secondary, and then back through a hole in the primary to the, ultimately through a, some corrector lenses, through a filter assembly, and then ultimately into the camera. They, normally, recoding is a, a process that occurs every few years. I don't know when the last time this has been reilluminized. They have uh, really high-tech overcoatings now, which really helps. If you just left bare aluminum, it would oxidize in no time. So all of these optics, the the, uh, the secondary is actually uh, coated with uh, silver, I believe. Uh, silver is an excellent uh, reflective material. Gold is really good. They use that a lot for space telescopes. Um, but you, you have to overcoat them because uh, they'll just oxidize and then the reflectivity goes down. So these are the magnificent gigapixel cameras. So GPC-1 on the left, which has been taking images since 2009. And on a good night, we'll take about 600 images with this camera. So it's taken a lot of images over the years. And then Gigapixel 2, uh, it's, it, they're just completing all the, the tests in the lab, and we're hoping it's going to be here in about another month. So taken together, PS1 and PS2 have about 2.9 billion pixels, which is comparable to a large telescope they're building in Chile called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This is an 8.2 meter survey telescope with a 3.2 gigapixel camera. So when it comes online, it'll surpass us as having the distinction of having the world's largest CCD camera. This is another view of GPC-1. I, I just wanted to show a picture with a human being next to it so you get a sense of the scale. So it's really an enormous device. Um, and I'll show you a, a raw image here. So this is the footprint of the entire mosaic. So it consists of 60 orthogonal transfer arrays. Each orthogonal transfer array consists of an 8 by 8 array of 600 by 600 CCDs. So these, each one of these little tiny squares is 600 by 600. So if you take the number of uh, orthogonal transfer arrays, which is 60, multiply by 8 times 8, times 600, times 600. That's 1,382,400,000. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, most people's digital cameras are in the maybe mega, megabyte range. This is gigabyte, or giga, sorry, gigapixel. So yeah, a gigapixel is a billion pixels. So yeah, this, and like I said, this is the world's largest CCD camera. Does anyone want to guess what that large extended object in the upper part of the images? I'll give you another hint. It's extended. Somebody was on the right track. It's a galaxy. Anyone want to guess what galaxy? Uh, 
Anyone? Got a, I got a coveted Panstar's pen for anyone that <laughs> wants to. Okay. There's a, there's a picture of this galaxy down the hallway. If you ever walk down the hallway outside of the Panstar's control room, Andromeda. <laughs> also known as M31 because it was from Charles Messier's catalog of objects to avoid looking at when you're hunting for comets. <laughs> so, and then I'll, I, I've just zoomed in a bit. So this is just one, one OTA. So you can see the structure in the dust lanes and all the rest of it. So most telescopes would only capture a small portion of M31 because M31 is, is enormous. It's the only galaxy that you can see with your naked eye. It's about 3.5 magnitude, but it's got to be a clear moonless night. They, we used to, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that. And then here's uh, Gigapixel, or GPC-2 um, in the lab in Manoa. And as I said, it's, it, together we're going we're gonna to have almost as many pixels as LSST. Data rate will be only maybe about a quarter of LSST. But four years sooner, and with a fraction of the resources that LSST has. One of the things that I, I wanted to mention before was that d despite what people may say, size matters. At least, I mean in astronomy. So you really do want a larger telescope because if you double the aperture of your telescope, you quadruple the light gathering ability. So an 8 meter class telescope has 16 times the light gathering ability of a 2 meter class telescope. But unfortunately, the cost scales exponentially. So you know, a, an 8 meter telescope doesn't cost four times as much as a 2 meter telescope. It costs you know, probably 400 times. So that's the thing about the, the PanStars project. These are small telescopes on a small budget with a small team delivering world class results. So here's the uh, filter assembly. So these filters are enormous. And we have a set of six filters, I believe it is. Uh, and I'll show you the uh, filter profiles in a minute. And then there's the shutter, also known as the pineapple chopper. Somebody had the bright idea. This is not the real shutter, by the way. This is just a, a plywood mock-up because they would have a fit if somebody actually did that with the real, you know, because all this stuff's assembled in like in a clean room and stuff. So, but anyway, they, 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 somebody had, you know, wanted to show, give it a sense of scale. And since we're in Hawaii, you know, pineapple seems to be a good measure. How many pineapples wide and how many pineapples deep. So it's a, it's a four by four, you know, 16 square pineapples is your area. And then here's the filter profiles. So these are wideband filters. Um, that range anywhere from the 400 nanometers, which is out in the near the ultraviolet region, to all the way past 1,000 nanometers, which is in the near infrared. And we also have a wideband filter called W, which is basically just a combination of the uh, GRI. And we use that one be, to get to maximize our throughput to let them get collect the most amount of photons. And we do that nowadays in the dark time when the moon's not out. And then we have our other filter sets, we're, which were used for the survey. Um, and nowadays we primarily observe in I-band, which is in this kind of red region, and in W. And you can see that the response falls off once you get into the near infrared. You reach a limit basically at about 1,100 nanometers, or 1.1 microns, which is the corresponds to the band gap in silicon. So if you want to go redder than that, you can't use silicon detectors anymore. You have to go with other technology. And then you get into infrared astronomy. So the, here's a kind of a flow chart of the operations. So one of the nice things about working for PanStars is we run it remotely from a control room down the hall in the second floor here. And so 
This is shown schematically here. This is the ATRC in Pukalani. So we, we control the telescope, which is on Haleakala, from here. Uh, now, the data used to go to the Maui High Performance Computing Center in Kihei, but we recently migrated that entire system to Manoa. And the gentleman at the back of the room was involved in, uh, in, to a large part in that endeavor, which was a lot of work, because they had to pack up crates and crates. Like, I think they used uh, those pods or whatever. Yeah, to, to pack up all the computer equipment. As you can imagine, there's a lot of storage space that you need. When you have a gigapixel camera, the, the data rate is, it's, it's, I don't know, gigabytes per second or something. Like, a, a night's worth of observing is going to be measured in terabytes. And the storage capability you need is measured in petabytes, which is 1,000 terabytes or a million gigabytes. So it's a lot of storage uh, capabilities. So this slide was, uh, is a bit outdated. So that, that we now do everything. Everything's piped over to Manoa. We have an extremely sophisticated uh, data reduction pipeline, or it's called the IPP, Image Processing Pipeline. And this is all handled by the folks uh, at the Manoa campus of the IFA on Oahu. And then ultimately, the data products are then available um, through this uh, archive that's hosted by the Space Telescope Science Institute. And this really has fundamentally changed the way astronomy is going to be done in the future. The, the PANSTAR survey uh, is an amazing human achievement. And that data set is going to be mined for decades. I mean, they, it kind of changes the way you do astronomy. Now you've got this massive data set. You can just do data mining if you want to figure out, you know, do a survey of brown dwarfs or do, you know, look at AGNs or look at all these exotic objects in the universe. You've got access to this massive data archive and you can pull the information out of there. And I mean, there's going to be just, it, this will probably go on for decades. Phenomenal. And like I said, the, the, it's run from the ATRC right here. And for me personally, this is, you know, I really appreciate the fact that I don't have to drive up and down from the summit. <laughs> Especially after, like, in the wintertime when you put in, like, a 13-hour night shift. The last thing you want is a long drive from a windy mountain road and then ultimately to your house. So I, I just live in Upper Kula, so I'm about 10 minutes from here, and it's, it's just great. I used to work on Mauna Kea, and, and there you have to live up there, live at Halipohaku, the mid-altitude facility, for the duration of your shift because you can't just go up and down from sea level to high altitude. You have to actually go the night before your shift to acclimate to the high altitude. So Haleakala is, I don't really consider it high altitude. It's 10,000 feet. It's, it's kind of on the borderline of high altitude. If you want real high altitude, then go to Mauna Kea and you'll, you'll definitely notice it. But so that's, that's one of the nice things about working here. There's the, the remote operations. And this is a real trend in astronomy nowadays. Uh, there's two things, remote observing and robotic telescopes. So completely autonomous telescopes that require, you know, they don't have to be uh, over, you know, you don't have to have a human overlord. But, um, but remote observing, yeah, that's a, that's a big trend. Even the Keck telescopes are run remotely from Wailea. And there's uh, the obligatory photograph that I had to put on my Facebook page <laughs> to my friends back home. So I must admit, when I first started working here, when you first see that bank of 12 monitors, and you're used to sitting in front of one or two monitors, it's a little overwhelming. But a lot of the ones up top, the four up top, are really just used to monitor the weather, uh, look at the, the guiding, look at some of the instrument parameters. And the, most of the action happens down in these lower screens down here. Now, this is just for PS1. So when PS2 comes online, then there's another bank of monitors over to the right outside of this picture because we couldn't get them all in one picture. And so then, well, you can imagine what's going to happen when PS2 comes online. So... <laughs> This is the ideal PanStars observer. So one of our, uh, Natalia, who uh, left to go to grad school in New Zealand, while she was leaving to go to New Zealand, I was arriving here from Canada, and so I think we passed each other in, in the air somewhere. 
But anyway, she, she had a sense of humor, and she, this drawing is still on our whiteboard because no one, no one wants to erase it because it's, they have fond memories of Natalia as well as the fact that it's, it's a really appropriate diagram. So you can see that the four arms, the two heads, and this, you know, each head has six eyes. So that's what it takes to be a Panstars observer once PS2 comes online. So I guess maybe I should just enjoy it, PS1 while I can. So here's an example of, of some of the, um, this is a coverage map for the surveys that we're doing now. They're not really surveys, they're, they're the OSSR is the Opposition Solar System Reconnaissance, I think is the acronym. And this is in I-band, and this is, the, the gray, this is the grayscale image. So the dark areas are areas that don't have very much coverage, and the light areas have more coverage. And does anyone want to hazard a guess what this dark region here is? The Milky Way. Who said that first? We have another winner. Coveted NASA. Do you want a NASA sticker or a pen? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, come and see me later and, and, and get your prize. Okay. So this... Uh, so this kind of serves as a guide for us when we're planning, which is, you know, probably, in all, in all honesty, is the hardest part of the job. The observing is one thing, but scheduling the telescope time is a completely different thing. And it's really the hardest part of the job. Because there's, you know, I don't know if any of you ever heard of the traveling salesman problem. It's an intractable mathematical problem. So there's a thousand ways to come up with a schedule, some of which are better than others if you apply some kind of efficiency criteria to it. But anyway, that's the, so this is one of the things we use to help figure out, okay, you know, maybe we should start filling in some of these holes where we don't have a lot of data and just, just, instead of keep repeating the same areas all the time. So what typically we do, at least with, at least with the OSSR observations, is we um, do a series of exposures and these are all, this is all uh, so automated sort of by the computer. You, once you select a, a, we call these chunks. Once you select a chunk, then the telescope will automatically, you know, it'll start at the first chunk, move to the next chunk, move to the next chunk, next chunk, next chunk, next chunk and work its way through the whole sequence of exposures. And then it'll repeat that cycle four times. And the idea behind that is this, this um, is geared towards finding moving objects, i.e. NEOs or asteroids. And I've done this plot in, in right ascension declination, so you can see the footprint of each, each exposure. And then if I, typically when we're observing, we, we have a different projection, which is uh, alt azimuth coordinates. And in that projection, you can see the footprints of all the different visits. So this, this N7 chunk probably has anywhere from uh, well, a typical chunk has anywhere from 48 to 80 exposures. It'll take anywhere from 45 minutes to about 70 minutes. And, and that whole sequence. And so you've got, vi you know, you've got visit one, visit two, visit three, visit four, to at each of the positions. And then we have this very sophisticated um, image processing system called MOPS, which kind of mops up these fast-moving objects. It's a moving object processing system. And what they do typically then is they'll, they'll look at visit one and visit two in the same region. Then they'll subtract the two images. So if anything is moved, it's going to just jump right out at you. It's a very, very efficient system. They're moving pretty fast. You'll, you'll see them just, you'll just see a streak on the image. The exposure times are typically about 45 seconds. So yeah, so you'll just see, if it's a satellite or a meteor or something like that, you'll just see a, a streak right across the image. So th for the first few years, the first five years or so, the survey was um, done by an international consortium called the PanStars uh, One Science Consortium, PS1SC. And like I said, it's really international. There's, 
National Science Foundation, of course, in the U.S., NASA, Space Telescope Science Institute, University of Hawaii, Max Planck Institute, John Hopkins, uh, Queen's University, Belfast, Durham University, University of Edinburgh, uh, Maryland, I, I'm probably forgetting some of them, and also Las Cumbres also contributed. And I think this is a, a Taiwanese organization as well. So a real, a real international consortium. And that they funded the first few years to do the, to do the survey. So from 2009 to 2014, our funding came from the PS1 Science Consortium. Once the survey was wrapped up, uh, the last few years we've been funded primarily by NASA to discover and characterize near-Earth objects. And then looking forward, uh, starting next year, we're going to broaden that search for the NEOs, also funded by NASA. We're going to do a wide area survey for NEOs that should keep us going until 2022. Now, our director is always looking for people to buy into the telescope. And do, so we, we do supernova observations for uh, a group out of the University of Chicago, uh, supernova follow-up stuff. And that's part of what I mentioned about the rapid response system. So it's not just a survey. And especially now going forward, you know, now that the bulk of the survey has been completed, you know, we're really uh, putting a lot of emphasis on the NEO stuff and the follow-up stuff. And... Uh, These are objects. These are objects that cross the orbit of the Earth. So they they have the potential of possibly impacting the Earth. About one and a half astronomical. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Yep. Okay. Sure. Near-Earth objects are typically, uh, the question was how far out are near-Earth objects. They typically are about one and a half astronomical units from the sun. The Earth is one astronomical unit, okay? Most of the main belt asteroids, they live between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, so we don't consider them near-Earth objects. So only the ones that kind of make that excursion into the inner solar system and cross the Earth's orbit potentially. So the PANSTAR surveys, uh, most of the time, about 60% of it was spent on the 3 pi steradian sky survey. Um, a small amount of time on calibrations, about a quarter of the time on a medium deep survey where they took 10 different fields, sort of scattered all around the sky, and then just hammered those areas to go deep. Or in this case, they call it medium deep. And we're still, doing, we're still doing parts of the medium deep survey. They spent some time on some solar system stuff, uh, a pan planets program, which is high cadence observations of uh, uh, the planets, stellar transit survey, and, uh, and about 2% of the time on a, what's called Pandromeda. And that was a time domain survey of, of M31, the Andromeda galaxy. So looking for things that change over time. This is the thing that PanStars is really good at. These things are called transients. Now things can be transient either because they, they change in brightness or they can be transient in the spatial sense in that they're moving. And this is what PanStars is really good at. So here's the result of the three pi survey. And I have some uh, cards in here. You guys can probably help yourselves if any of you are interested. Um, this, this is the result of three, almost 400,000 exposures. So it doesn't look that impressive on a piece of cardboard. If you were going to print that out at the full resolution, this dimension would be about a mile and a half, and it would take up the area of a golf course, typically. So yeah, I mean... These are, you're talking 50 to 100 visits at each location, 374,000 some odd exposures. What they've done here is they've combined the, the, the GRNI filter data and channeled it into the typical um, RGB channels to give you this color image. And of course, everyone knows what that is, Milky Way. And then this is just another projection 
this is now in galactic coordinates. So now the, now the Milky Way is a linear feature running across the center of the image. And then what's this big dark? Is that a black hole? <laughs> okay, so keep in mind, this is called the three pi steradian survey. Now this is one for the, the real keeners in the crowd. Does anyone know what solid angle the entire celestial sphere would, would subtend? Steradian is a measure of solid angle. Does anyone know the area of a sphere in terms of its radius? Right. You're close. Four, that's the volume of a sphere. Surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. So in a, a sphere, the celestial sphere would subtend four pi steradians. So our survey did three pi steradians. How come why only three pi? Because we're in the northern hemisphere, so we can only get down to a declination of about minus 30 degrees. Now we are since extending the three pi, we're, we still take three pi data, but we're doing it really far south to get below the minus 30. We can get to about minus 45 dec. Uh, but then if you want to fill that hole in this diagram, you've got to add data from the southern hemisphere. But, you know, 75% of the sky is not too, not too shabby. And then here's some, some of the, uh, the maps uh, show how complete the surveys are. So, for instance, this is an I-band. You've got, you're going down to almost 23rd magnitude probably on average at least 22nd magnitude over the entire survey area. The survey depths in the stacked images range from about 23rd magnitude in the G-band to about 21st magnitude in the, in the uh, I believe that's the Y-band. And so what, what does that mean? What's, what's 21st magnitude? That's pretty faint. The, on a really dark, night, moonless night, if you were about 20 years younger than me and had good eyes still, you could probably see it down a sixth magnitude. So 21st magnitude is a million times fainter than that. And we can get that in, well, this is the stacked images. So these are those images that have been added up over the, the whole duration of the survey. That's how we've been able to get that deep. So here's uh, just another um, summary of the survey. So one of the amazing things about the survey is that it has a huge coverage, 3 pi steradians. It gets down to anywhere from 21st to 23rd magnitude. The photometric calibration is good to about, on average, about 7 milli magnitudes. And the astrometry is around one or two milli arc seconds. So that, that is phenomenal. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And here's a little blurb on the PanStars archive, and I, I've got some handouts. You're welcome to take one on your way out tonight that's being hosted by the Space Telescope Science Institute. One of the fun things you can do, I mean, I, you know, I don't expect all of you are going to go data mining and looking for, you know, active galactic nuclei or something, but if you want to make yourself a pretty picture, just go into the interface. Oh, before I, I go there, I just wanted to mention that since the, the, um, since the public release last December, this is the bar chart. It shows the data volume in terabytes per month since the survey was released. So HST, 8 terabytes a month. Panstar is 18. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Amazing. So here's the, the interface is pretty slick actually. So you can type in the name of an object and do a search for it. And then if you want to combine the images and take it in the different filters, you can then generate a, a sort of a false, oops, a false color image if you like of the object. And that's in this particular case, I'm not sure which object this is. Oh, it's M101, one of the Messier galaxies, the galaxies in the Messier catalog. 
So this is one of the fun things you can do. And you can play around with the saturation. You can make them lighter and darker in the different uh, RGB channels. You can play around with different filters. I mean, it's, just, it's a fun thing to do if you've got extra time on your hands. <coughs> so here's a, um, this is actually, if you go to this website, somebody produced this beautiful color image of the Lagoon and Triffid Nebula. And you can pan and zoom through this image and, and you know, zoom in uh, quite a bit. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty neat. So lots of pretty pictures. Someone else took a constructed, reconstructed the Herschel 400 catalog, which is a catalog of various NGC objects from the from the uh, the three pi survey. And this is another website you can visit and and look at these beautiful little pretty pictures. And then here's a selection of planetary nebulae. And then there's uh, there's over three billion objects in the in the survey. So, yeah, it could, you could, you know, keep busy. Here's some of the Messier objects you're familiar with. There's M31. Of course, the famous M42. What's the other name for this? Orion Nebula? Pen or NASA sticker? You've already got a pen? So, NASA sticker? Okay, there you go. All right. And just some more, yeah, I always like to throw these pretty pictures in, especially in today's day and age. When we're so spoiled from HST, from Hubble. You get these amazing photographs from Hubble, and it's like, and then when you go and look in a backyard telescope, it's kind of like disappointing, like, how come it doesn't look like the Hubble image? <laughs> so some more just pretty pictures. I'm just going to breeze through these. Okay, so now the amazing thing about the survey is that you can study all kinds of aspects of astronomy, anywhere from solar system objects to quasars. You can do cosmology, uh, exoplanets. I mean, it, it's just the sky's the limit, basically. And, and really, they, they barely scratched the surface of the science that you can do with this, this data set. And like I said earlier, the, the, people are going to be mining this data set for decades. There's, there's going to be hundreds of PhD uh, dissertations coming out of this data. So anywhere, like I said, the inner solar system, outer solar system, solar neighborhood, brown dwarfs, exoplanets. Uh, you can map the structure of the dust in the Milky Way. Um, we did a deep survey of M31. Um, there's a whole area of... of transits. There was another survey called uh, PSST, which uh, it's not really a catchy acronym because it's like, what is that? Psst, psst. So not the catchiest acronym I've ever heard, but that was the Palomar uh, survey for, oh geez, Palomar survey for stellar transients or something. But anyway, so really PanSTARS is what we call a time domain machine. And we've discovered almost 3,300 near-Earth objects, almost 300 what are called PHAs, or potentially hazardous asteroids. These are the ones that have the potential to possibly impact the Earth. These are the ones that NASA is particularly interested in. And um, a handful of comets, um, supernovae, I mean, almost 6,000 supernova just since January 2016. Um, and so, on average, we detect about two NEOs a day. Now, when I say detect, we're not necessarily discovering new NEOs. We are detecting NEOs, and then once you figure out the orbit, you'll know whether it's an existing NEO or whether it's a new one. This week was, but other than the last two nights where the weather's been crap, we had some good weather at the beginning of the week, and the last time I ran this program called NeoCrawl, it spat out 51 detections in three days. So it was a, a particularly good week for us. On average, about 11 supernova per day. So if you look at the, compare it with other surveys, PanSTARS reports more discoveries of solar system objects and supernovae than all other surveys combined. And PS2 is only going to double that. So really impressive. Now this is a, a bar graph 
off the Wikipedia page that shows near-Earth asteroid discoveries by survey. So Catalina was, when Catalina came online in 2004 or 2003, I don't know, actually came in online earlier, but it really ramped up the NEO stuff in 2004. And Catalina was really just mopping up. And then look what happened. Something happened in 2010. This magenta color is pan stars. Pan stars, pan stars, pan stars. So it's really, we're, we're just dominating the NEO game. There is another little guy, this, this, this guy here, Neo Wise. It's hard to compete with Neo Wise because Neo Wise is the repurposed Wise space telescope. And it's been repurposed to look for NEOs. And so it, it's, it's one of our main competitors, but it, it probably doesn't have a very long lifetime. So anyway, l the, the main thing I want you to get out of this is that since Panstar's got into this game, we're, we're just mopping up. And here's, a, there's many, very many, a lot of Comet Panstars. There's not just one, there's, there's a, almost 200 now. So this is one, I, I took this photo when I was in Arizona in 2013. Cause just because I thought it was cool because here's the new, uh, you know, the crescent moon and then here's the comet over there. It's not very often that we get to see naked eye comets. And of course you guys probably all remember Teakutaki and, and Hale-Bopp. Those were amazing. Now there's uh, one of my colleagues, Heather Fleveling, is really active in the social media aspects of Panstars and, and there's a actual, um, I guess it's a Twitter, a, a Twitter feed that um, you can follow the NEOs and it'll give you automated updates when, when we identify a near, near Earth asteroid. We actually discovered one last week and I'll, I think that's a couple slides on. So here's another, I'm gonna ask you some more questions, hope you don't mind. This is a, a graphical depiction of the objects that are in the solar system. So we talked about this a little earlier when, when I think you asked about the, the near-Earth objects. So most of the asteroids live in the asteroid belt, which is this green region here, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter out here. Of course, here's the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth. So there is a, a population of these near-Earth objects, and these are the ones we're interested in. So I'm going to ask you a couple easy questions first. I want to ask you ultimately how many objects there are in our solar system. So the easiest answer, and there will be no prize for this, how many stars are in our solar system? Okay. How many planets? Yeah, it's either eight or nine, isn't it? Well, Pluto got demoted. <laughs> Pluto, it's called a dwarf planet. So there's actually eight planets, and there's five dwarf planets. There's about almost 600,000 asteroids. And there's about 3,100 comets. And there's one called Apophis. I don't know when it's coming by around, I think 2029. So you, you'll have to Google it when you get home. So I, I'm not totally up on it. <laughs> so this was taken from the uh, International Astronomical Union their, their minor planet center. So this, this guy was discovered last week on July 15th. He's an Apollo asteroid, classified as a PHA, potentially hazardous asteroid. So these are the guys that, that we're especially interested in. And so you can see at the top of the list, Panstars. We were the first to get it. And then all these other observatories followed it up. You need to, you need to follow these observations up to, to be able to compute an orbit for these things. And then you continue to observe them to refine the orbit. And that's so even though, you know, all the, the, the NEOs that we detect, they're, they're not all new discoveries, but those observations then get added to the existing observations to refine the orbit. And so this is a, a, a schematic of this guy. This is why he's called a, a PHA, because here's the Earth's orbit is the, is the blue orbit, and here's our asteroid in yellow. So you can see he, he's got the potential to get pretty close. Now, Safan emailed me this article the other day, and I wanted to pass it on. So this is an asteroid that Panstars discovered in, in 2012, 
and it's going to make a close approach to the Earth on October 12th. Um, the, it's not a very well-defined orbit because it was only based on uh, a few observations and it hasn't been seen again for in five years. So they haven't really been able to refine the orbit much. They expect it'll pass no closer than about 6,800 kilometers and more likely, probably more like 170,000 uh, miles in this instance or about two-thirds of the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So we consider that a, that's a close approach. When they come within the, the moon's orbit, yeah, that's uncomfortably close. Yeah. So be on the lookout for this guy, but he's pretty faint. We, they think it's about 10 to 30 meters in diameter. And for comparison, the asteroid that hit uh, Chelyabinsk in Russia, they think was about 20 meters across. And it uh, fragmented in the atmosphere, I think about uh, 15 miles up in the atmosphere and created, um, the, the energy that was released from that event was, I believe, equivalent to 30 Hiroshima bombs. So we're talking megatons. <coughs> so, you know, a, a 10 to 30 meter asteroid hitting the Earth is, is not a good thing. So here's a, um, we're going to change gears here now from the NEO stuff to some of the other stuff that we do. And we routinely do follow-ups of supernova. So somewhere in this image, there's a supernova. It's kind of hard to tell because it's, you, you got 1.4 billion pixels to sort through. But I'm going to make it easier for you. I'm going to zoom in on it. Now, does anyone want to take a wild stab at where the supernova is? It's not the X. The X is actually a dead um, CCD. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my prizes here. This, this is a hard one, so you, you get a pen for this one. <laughs> okay, anybody? Last call. Bottom left where? Okay, be more specific. Close. It was this guy here. So here's the host galaxy. There's the supernova. So this is zoomed in a lot. You know, if I back it out, there's the full mosaic, the full camera. And then we're zooming into a, one of these OTAs and then finally zooming in. So yeah, so we routinely do, we'll do anywhere from one to half a dozen supernova a night, follow-up observations of supernova. And that, I was just showing you where it is. So, sorry. Better luck next time. <coughs> this is a, I actually used to play this game with the grad students at like observatory all the time. We would, we would do the supernova observations with the one meter telescope and I would always play this game of spot the supernova, I called it. And uh, they, were, they were pretty keen to figure it out. So, you know, if you look through that data set, you can find a lot of things. So one of my colleagues, Heather on Oahu, pulled these, uh, just made this little gallery of variable stars from the, looking at the photometry of the objects in the data set. And another uh, colleague, Gene on Oahu, uh, was mining the data set and found the first free-floating planet. So this is a planet that doesn't have a host star. It's just, yep. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you spotted that, did you? Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 
Okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> so here's our lonely planet. Well, it probably got ejected at some point from its host solar system. I'm not, this is not my research specialty. There's a, there's a paper in my office if you want to read it that, that describes it. It's just the way, well, it's, it's because of the fact that because of its color, and they did follow-up spectroscopy, I think, with Keck, I think, and its color, luminosity, and mass puts it in this range of cold planets uh, around young stars. So it's, it's, I think it's colder than a, than, a, um, than a brown dwarf. Where's the brown dwarfs? Yeah, there's different types of dwarfs. So it's really an outlier in this plot. So it doesn't fit with the other, like the M dwarfs and the, and the T dwarfs, and so it's kind of just off in, in by itself. So here's a, a, a color magnitude diagram of some star clusters. So this is what you can do with, this is probably like a couple hours worth of data on the telescope. And you can produce these amazing color magnitude diagrams. Um, this is, uh, once again, the, the search for transients. In the, in the medium deep fields, um, they've discovered like 7,000 explosive transients. Uh, 600 have been spectroscopically confirmed, and so, you know, this is a big uh, area of research. They discovered almost 2,000 Cepheids in the M31 time domain survey, and I don't know, if it, mo most of you probably know, but Cepheid variables are a primary distance indicator. There's a known relationship between the period and luminosity of the Cepheid variable stars, so if you observe the period, or how long it takes them to change in brightness, that correlates with their luminosity. And if you know their luminosity and you know their apparent brightness, you can figure out their distance. And so these are, are distance indicators. And they discovered about 300 eclipsing binaries in M31. And 11 of these are probably bright enough that you could do spectroscopy on them with a 10 meter class telescope. Once you do that, once you get the the light curve and the spectrum, you can combine that information to get the luminosity, which then in turn is going to let you figure out the distance. And this is, uh, this would help pin down the Hubble constant because in the, in the distance ladder scheme of things, M31 is, you know, the, the nearest objects are kind of like your anchor point. So M31 is like an anchor. So we refer to that as the anchor distance. And that contributes about a third of the error budget in evaluating the Hubble constant. So if we can reduce the uncertainty in, the, in that uh, anchor distance, we can reduce the uncertainty in h naught. So this is cosmology. So other kinds of weird and exotic things that you can find in the data are things like uh, hypernova. These are super luminous supernovae. And, uh, and I guess this is not my, my area of expertise, but I just threw it in there just because, I mean, it's, there's so many things out there that you can investigate. So these, these super lo luminous um, explosions, if you like, they're about 100 times more luminous than a, a typical supernova. And so we don't see hydrogen or helium in the spectra, and so the question is what, what's powering this extreme luminosity. And we found them out to like a redshift of one and a half in the medium deep fields and redshifts anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3 in the three pi survey. So the current thinking is that these things are magnetars. So somehow they, they, they're collapsed uh, neutron stars with an extremely strong magnetic field. And somehow that magnetic energy is getting inje injected into the, into the um, surrounding uh, explosion and, and resulting in this huge increase in the, in the luminosity. And so one of the major results is that they think basically all of these things can be explained by magnetars and that these so-called pair instability supernova are a very, would be a very small fraction of, of any of these objects. Um, quasars. 
you can go out to almost redshift seven. So these are quasars in the first giga year of the universe's existence, these high redshift objects. And you see them in these kind of color, color plots. This is how they show up. They don't have the same properties as typical uh, other uh, objects. And so they've been identified as, as quasars. And they also have distinct, distinct uh, spectra. And of course, the spectra would be obtained from other observatories. So what our director now is doing is he's uh, we, we've been getting involved in this uh, special campaign, which is a survey for these transients. And these things are triggered by the next generation of non-electromagnetic observatories. So you've probably heard of LIGO. This is uh, designed to detect gravitational waves. And Ice Cube is in the Antarctic, and it's a neutrino observatory. So when LIGO gets a detection, we get message that there's been a detection, and then we gear, or, or sorry, before I go there, um, in conjunction with ATLAS and other observatories, large observatories, um, we, we try to follow up that detection, because these, these observatories, they can't pinpoint the location where the source is coming from. They get a detection. But they don't know, th their uh, positional uncertainty is huge. So this, this is a, a probability uh, contour map of where, you know, they think the object is probably coming from. But this is huge. This is, you know, zero degrees to 50 degrees. And it's, you know, I don't know what the scale on this is comparable. So there's a huge positional uncertainty. So telescopes like PANSTARS or, or um, ATLAS can follow up because of our large field of view and our rapid response system. So the, the ones in green, I think, are the PANSTARS footprints, and then the gray, I believe, is ATLAS. And in the process of doing that, we discovered a handful of transients. Now, we don't know what kind of objects they are, because you need to do follow-up spectroscopy. The vast majority of them are supernova, but you'll also have active, active galactic nuclei and all kinds of other exotic objects just showing up from these types of follow-ups. The ultimate aim of this is to pinpoint what was the source, what triggered that gravitational wave. Was it a, a, you know, two black holes coalescing together? That's one of the current models because that's how much energy it takes to produce a gravitational wave that's detectable. These things are incredibly weak. And so, Basically, and I took this out of Ken's talk um, that he gave for the 50th anniversary on Oahu of, uh, last month. And so essentially the discoveries in the time domain increase linearly with time. And the rate of NEO and, and stationary trans transients is going to stay basically constant. Adding PS2 is going to double that rate of discovery. But to exploit that data requires follow-up resources. Like when we detect an NEO, it goes out to the broader community, and we, it's our hope that other observatories will follow up those observations so we can pin down the orbit. Uh, the same with the supernova stuff. If, if we find a transient in one of our fields, it's our hope that other observatories are, there, are then going to obtain spectra of that to classify what type of object it is, what type of supernova, et cetera. And the problem with any kind of survey is that the, the depth of the survey sort of increases as the square root of the integration time. So eventually, you get to a point of diminishing returns, where you're going to keep hammering away, hammering away, but you're just slowly gaining depth. So looking forward, really, our emphasis now is on the NEO stuff and not so much on the static sky. And we're doing the NEO surveys in, in, the, in the wide band, W band during dark time, and then I band during bright time. We also continue to do some of the three pi stuff in, in Z and Y. Um, and the hope is that we can then join forces with other people that have other resources and sort of work in collaboration with them. When LSST comes online, it's not going to put us out of business because it's in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's just going to complement what, what we've done, fill in the hole. So special thanks to, I wanted to say a thanks to Ken Chambers, our, our fearless leader, and Mark Huber, part of the image processing team. 
Heather Fleveling, she's also with the image processing team, and she's really the one that was instrumental in designing the database for the PanStars data. And of course, the entire PanStars team. And I, 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 I have to mention Rob Ratkowski, a local photographer who's taken some amazing photographs and was kind enough to let me have some of his photographs that I've used in this talk and other talks as well. And so it's not a very big team. Um, there's, there's really, there's the, some technicians on Maui that we rely on to keep everything running smoothly. There's a small group of observers. Um, there's the image processing team and the science team on, on uh, Oahu and a space telescope science team as well to, to manage the database. So the bottom line is, you know, this is a amazing observatory that is really producing world-class results on a shoestring budget. And at that, I'd like to say thanks a lot for coming. Um, please take one of the handouts if you want on your way out. I think I owe somebody a, a prize there in the back row. And so th thanks again. Okay, questions? Right. So the, the question was, uh, is there a PS3 or a PS4, or was there ever planned to be? The original concept of PanStars was they were going to have four. The idea was if we had four two-meter class telescopes, we could get the equivalent aperture of an eight-meter telescope for a fraction of the cost. But, you know, that, that didn't pan out, pardon the pun. <coughs> But, but um, um, so we're happy with the two that we have. They, they also were going to operate in what's called distributed aperture mode, where all the telescopes would be pointing at the same object at the same time. That, that's really technologically challenging. So I think the, the, the mode that we're running in now has been really efficient at detecting transient objects, uh, things that change in time, things that change in space. And like I said, PANSERS is really a, a time domain machine, and the, the survey is is incredible. The, the amount of data that, that's in that survey is, is just mind-boggling. We, we, no, we don't use any adaptive optics. Yeah, no. Any other questions? Yep. Well, Johns Hopkins goes beyond medicine. Yeah, the, the, the question was, uh, she was asking about John, Johns Hopkins. And they, there's actually, they do have a large medical component, but I, they also have a research uh, institute there as well. So, yeah. Three quarters of the sky, basically. Yeah. The, the, the thing, that's what is called one epoch. Yeah, the, the question had to do with the, the extent of the survey. How much can you do in one year? And you're basically going to be able to see the entire sky visible from this site in the course of a year. So that's referred to as one epoch. Now, the survey was done over multi, multiple years. So it's, those images have been stacked up over many years. Yep. Is there any other equivalent The question had to do with is, is there any other observatories that are going to cover the other missing 25%? And the answer is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope in Chile when it comes online in 2020. So it'll, it'll fill, it'll get three quarters of the sky. So there'll be, there'll be quite a bit of overlap. There'll be about 50% overlap. But then they'll get that 25% that we can't get. And they're, they're an eight meter class telescope too. So their, their survey depth is gonna be, exceed what we can do here. Um, I, I imagine, yeah, with the survey telescope, uh, the question had to do with, um, if, if LSST is also going to be involved in NEOs, and I would have to say the answer is yes. Yeah. Another question? How effective, um, potentially effective, is the PANSARS in discovery for planets or other types of objects with fractionally low emissions? Okay, the question had to do with uh, how, ef how efficient PANSARS would be at, detract, at detecting things like Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, keep in mind that Kuiper Belt is 
in the farthest reaches of our solar system. So Kuiper Belt objects are very faint. Um, probably, you know, 24th magnitude maybe, so they're probably beyond the, the survey depth. Um, I don't know if that's the, the case for all of them, but for the most part, you need a, a, a much larger telescope to get that deep. Yep. And, and you want to, you know, the, it's hard to stack the images because it's a moving object, right? So you really need a, deep tel a, a large telescope to do a relatively short exposure to be able to get that deep. Any other questions? Um, I don't have my cell phone here, but I usually get a, a message. Uh, I get a text message. The, the question was, uh, what triggers the LIGO events? What kind of triggers do we get? And, and we, we typically will get um, a text message. We'll come to the observers. And, and yeah, this is all coordinated by the folks in Manoa. So, you know, we're kind of like, would get the information third hand. The question, well, LIGO, or the question has to do with LIGO. How many, how many detections have they reported? I believe the first recorded detection was last year, I think, if I'm not mistaken, when it first came online. So there's been a few, I mean, these are not, you know, daily occurrences. Uh, because they're they're from exotic objects that are pretty rare, so but it's an exciting avenue of research. I mean, this is one of the one of the you know really at the forefront of our technology to be able to detect gravitational waves. So if we can contribute to help pin down where these things are coming from, that would be a huge uh, a huge boon to science. Any other questions, folks? Yes, one more. Yeah, the question was, does PanStar specialize in near-Earth objects? And, and the answer is, uh, after the 3 pi survey was completed, most of our research now has to do with NEOs, and most of our funding comes from NASA to, to go towards that end. Um, although we still do a lot of other follow-up stuff. We do a lot of the supernova stuff. We, we were actually did a campaign to monitor the Kepler fields. Uh, that These are fields uh, imaged by the Kepler uh, space telescope, which looks for uh, transiting exoplanets, and we found a uh, huge number of transients in the Kepler fields. Um, the uh, the LIGO stuff, and there's other stuff down the road that I'm not at liberty to discuss right now. Um, but um, yeah, no, we're we're trying to stay at the, the forefront of the of science, and and with PS2, it's it's going to double our capabilities, and I just have to grow two more arms and another head. <laughs> Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming.